uh, we will not actually be looking at the text of Song of Solomon tonight. Uh, I finished my study of it, and it's all ready to go. Uh, there are just a few things I thought were important to mention before we got going on into Song of Solomon, uh, besides what we mentioned last week. So, uh, first off, the name Song of Songs, uh, it's called either Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Uh, the name of Song of Songs means best song. It's kind of like when somebody says king of kings, that's like the best king, the king over all the other kings. So a, a song of songs, that's the best song, the songs, the song that is better than other songs, um, which is just good for clarity's sake. Um, as far as we can tell, um, the, the book of Song of Solomon follows a cl very clear progression. Um, it starts with the dating or courtship, however you want to call it. And it goes on to um, the uh, marriage, and then, or I should say, the wedding, and then life after the wedding. Um, so it clearly has three distinct sections there. Um, we'll talk about a breakdown in just a second. So that brings up the question: What is the basis of starting relationships? Does anybody want to offer their opinion of what is the basis of starting a relationship? What? Well, um, be a little more specific, like. Uh a romantic relationship or because there's, you know... Well, as it applies to Song of Solomon, so uh, an intimate relationship. Okay. Um, you guys can see the I think, first of all, yeah, it has to be are you serious about this or you just want to just... That's fine. So basically, are you a teenager who's less sick or are oh, you... Yeah. <laughs> you know, just you have you to have a... a, 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 a uh, a sir, how do you call it? You have to know what you're getting yourself into. Do you want to be committed, or mm. you just want to jump around? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, most people, I think, start uh, dating or um, because they're attracted to the person physically, not because they're attracted to them um, uh, for the right reasons. Okay, and in your opinion, is that? I mean, like. Um, if you're in a relationship with somebody, you need to be attracted to them physically to some point because then it's like, you know, I am exactly over here. <laughs> okay, so let me just. I don't think it's the most important thing. So let me just throw a, 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 a what if on that. What what about like arranged marriages and stuff where? No, I mean, I mean, um, like that's that's the thing. But I mean, you learn to to. I mean, like even if you're not attracted to them at first, you you learn to. So do you think a marriage, any intimate relationship whatsoever, can exist um, without physical attraction? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I think a marriage is is the main the main basis is having someone as your partner, not necessarily just physical. It's it's, it's a lot of friendship and and, and uh, relying on the other person and working with the other person. It's not just an attraction part. Okay. Anybody else have anything to say? Um, for me, it would be, it would be a different, because for me, it would have, I would have to have that physical attraction to be able to to be in a marriage with someone. I gotcha. I mean, not that it's the most important thing, obviously, but it's, it's still an important factor. Obviously. So here's, here's a good question. Um, do you feel like if you were attracted enough with yourself that you could just overlook her ugliness and just See yourself. I don't. I don't understand. Like pictures of yourself. Right. Like <laughs> make a mask of your face and, and your have face. them wear it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Okay. No, wait, no, wait. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back on track. Anybody else have anything to say? Or were you done? I didn't mean to cut you off if you weren't. Um. Well, also, um, I'm kind of going along with what you said. There's, uh, I believe that there's. No right or wrong reason, really. Like physical attraction is not really, is not necessarily a right or wrong reason. It's just you got to put the person's um, values or character before the, after that outer appearance. Kind of think gotta, about what you're doing, huh? You like gotta, what Diana was saying. You gotta look at the heart. You yeah. Gotta examine I'm sorry, but I would never date someone who has to see my heart. It's in my chest. You leave it there. <laughs> you cold monster. Oh 
I didn't say that. Stop taking me out of context. Oh, I said we. I said. I said we're in our prime, in our early twenties, late teens. That that's we we get over things easily. We hardly ever get sick. I mean, we bounce back. We don't wake up with pain. Then we get into our late twenties and things just start going downhill. And then we start getting wrinkles and that kind of stuff. Now I don't have a problem with wrinkles. I do. I don't have a problem with gray hair. I'm just saying that's the fact it starts hitting rather early. Like for instance, I'm almost bald and I don't have any. I'm not even thirty. My point. <laughs> people go bald in high school. That's another good point. <laughs> I, I think the main point of starting a relationship is if you can if you can imagine um, marrying this person with all their flaws that you know they have, and if you're okay with that, then you should you should be okay with dating them to get to the point. But I because, love him. Because you have to go into a marriage realizing that the person may never change. Because it's very rare that the person does change. You don't change. Like <laughs> you know what's interesting is that some people are attracted to physical flaws. Like, oh, yeah. said, like some girls like guys with scars. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so some good discussion. Let's look at some things that um, the Bible does specifically give some guidance on. Uh, the first is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Seven two, and it says, "But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband." So it, it goes on through this whole conversation. But just to give you a summary here, um, you can read the whole thing in chapter seven. I'm not going to, but um, so mutual attraction is definitely a a a point of getting married. Um, Paul even goes on to say later in this chapter that if you are so overcome by desire for this person, and they're so overcome by desire for you, just get married. Goodness sakes, just get married. Um, because it was better, it's better to learn that you don't like the person and have to work through that and learn to love them for who they are than it is to go into sin. That's his argument. Okay, so you can disagree with Paul or whatever. I, I'm not. Being, I'm just saying that's what he said. Okay. Um, the second reason is found in the next book, 2 Corinthians 6.14. And this is really something that's found throughout the whole Bible, but 2 Corinthians 6.14 is something that just kind of uh, says it very succinctly. So I, I felt like rather than going through the whole Bible about this, let's just look at one verse. Uh, Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteous and righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. Now this doesn't just apply to relationships. However, it does also apply to relationships. Um, so b both uh, both persons being believers, that's that's clearly a, a, a important point from the Bible. Uh, Proverbs twenty five twenty four. This is just one example. Um, read through the whole Proverbs to get kind of the fuller picture. But um, there's kind of this idea of um, whoops, sorry. There. There's kind of this idea that sometimes we don't really think when we get into a relationship, like as far as what the long term goal. Like here's a, here's a good example. People sometimes get with people because they like having sex with them. But past sex, there's a person, a real-life person. And you have to come to the conclusion, do I like this person apart from sex? And in our culture, it's very common for people to get together just on the basis of a sexual relationship, mm -hmm. which it really isn't a, isn't a firm foundation. Um, you really yeah. need something stronger than that because what happens if sex is taken out of the equation? And that is... Let me go through a couple of different ideas. Someone gets sick. Um, someone is facing something like cancer. It diminishes your sex drive. I mean, really, honestly. Um, if one, one or both partners are, are struggling with a pornographic kind of life, um, it affects things like erectile dysfunction, stuff like that. Uh, there's aging. Um, sometimes you're just not in the mood for things when you get older. I mean, and sometimes with age comes the idea that you, you, you can't. Um, do things and you might need medication. I'm going to go ahead and just leave it there, but you get what I'm saying. So it, it brings up a very important point. What happens if sex is taken out of the equation? Is it still a firm foundation? And uh, so they really, like Diana was saying already, there needs to be some kind of forethought about this person. I think somebody said about accepting somebody with their flaws. I think it was Gracie. Uh, so this is something that, that, that wisdom is definitely needed. Um, you know, people sometimes say, well, it's kind of racist that Proverbs has an entire chapter chapter devoted to what a woman should be like. But then you have to realize that it has 29 chapters about what a man should be like. Yeah. So. Yeah, so much for, uh, so much for uh, <laughs> male. I don't know. 
So Proverbs 25, 24 says, It is better to live in a corner of the roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. So here we get to a very important point. You all right? Yeah. Uh, past a woman's attraction is a person. And so sometimes that's hard for men to kind of wrap their heads around, that a woman is something besides just something to have sex with, that they actually have their own intellect and uh, emotions and desires and dreams and, and, and whatnot. Sometimes men just kind of see women as, as kind of like objects. Um, and, and, you know, Proverbs really talks about that a lot. Um, and, you know, you really have to kind of use some wisdom there. Um, is this really something, someone that I want to grow old with? <laughs> you know, that's a very important point. So Genesis chapter 26, uh, here's another reason. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. I just wanted to share a few different things. Um, because Song of Solomon is really about, you know, the lovers. So it's important to kind of weigh this against other things in the Bible. Uh, Genesis 26, verses 34 through 35 says this. Uh, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basemith, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, I don't want to emphasize the point about, multi about polygamy. I, I, we're completely skipping past that. <laughs> I was wondering if, how long that was going to go before you did that. Well, I'm wondering So, um, besides the whole issue of polygamy, there's a very important point here. Um, these women were not a good decision for family unity. These women, uh, honestly, w were a disgrace to the parents. So there's the question of, is this relationship honoring to the parents? Because remember, you had your family before you fell in love. And when the person who you fall in love with dies or, or maybe b betrays you or whatever, it's probably your family that you're going to fall back on. Now, obviously, that's not tr necessarily true for everyone. Do I, um, oh, say that again. I missed that. Which part? What you just said. Um, sometimes when people jump too quickly into a relationship, there can be some betrayal that kind of goes like sometimes, for instance, a guy will kind of talk sweet to a woman, but then when they get married, it'll turn out that he's very abusive. Oh. Uh, stuff like that. Um, and so then in those kinds of situations, it's very helpful to be able to go back to, like, for instance, the mother and father to get protection from the abusive person. Stuff like that. Um, now, obviously, that's not true for everyone because some people don't have their parents. Some people don't know their parents. Some people's parents abandon them. So there's a lot of different things like that. But uh, still, the Bible always talks about us honoring our parents regardless of whether we think that they deserve it or not. Um, and so one of those things, ways that we can show, show honor is to not get into a relationship that is just going to cause more grief to everyone. Um, but anyways, uh, so there's, other, uh, there's obviously other things. Uh, pick, a, pick a partner who's faithful. You know, I was reading in a marriage book this week. Oh my gosh, this 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 made me laugh. Um, he was telling the story about a husband who was uh, condemning his wife because she was showing a short temper. In fact, she he even was able to convince everyone in the congregation that uh, you know it, she was his burden to bear, and everybody you know through through manipulation you know and because she flipped out in public a couple times, obviously. I'll tell you why in just a second. And so she was able, he was able to get even the pastor to think that she was the bad one he was the victim in all this well throughout the course it turns out that the reason why she was getting mad at him is because he was being unfaithful and then he was saying that it was his christian duty to correct her for having a bad attitude what a what okay so let that kind of just simmer in your yeah. imaginations for a minute so obviously you want to find someone who's faithful if somebody's in it just playing a game don't commit to somebody who's not committing so then there's, then there's other things, mutual goals in life. For instance, let's say, just a, a great example, let's let's say I want to be, you know, Fortune 400 or 500, whatever the crap it's called, uh, you know, a leader of industry. And my wife wants to be a missionary and give up all of our possessions. Well, right there you have a very strong um, conflict of interest. <laughs> so mutual goals should probably be in there somewhere. Um, you know, I know young people, they can only think about love, but remember past love, there's is love going to pay your bills? No. Yes. It's not going to pay Reality your bills. Sits in. Do what? Reality sits in. Reality sits in. Right. Honeymoon can only last for so long. And after that honeymoon is gone, because it always goes, you're going to be left with somebody who doesn't work and is sitting on the couch eating all the food and playing video games all day. <laughs> so do you really want to commit to this? Um, okay. Um, but there's a few a few little little hints to pay attention for if you if anybody here is thinking about starting to date. Uh, first off, pay.
pay attention to how they treat waitresses. I know this seems like an important point and like an unimportant point, but it's actually very important. You can tell a lot by a person's inner character by how they treat waiters and waitresses. Um, another point, uh, look at how they treat their parents or look at the character of the parents because oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes a father, I mean a son will be a lot like the father and the daughter will be a lot like the mother. Not always, but a lot of times that's what happens. You find two main things that happen. Either the apple doesn't fall far, far from the tree and within five years you're going to say you're acting just like your mother or you're acting just like your father. Or it goes the exact opposite, and they try to do everything the exact opposite that their parent would do. Now, see, the problem with that is it's rooted in the same character. Like, for instance, let's say my dad is an alcoholic. So in wanting to not be an alcoholic, I display a different character. Like maybe um, I am very disciplined. I, I'm always working and that kind of stuff. But behind that, there will be a very similar attitude that is displayed in both the father and the son. Uh, maybe the, the reason why the father was an al alcoholic was because – he was selfish. So now I'm displaying selfishness in that I'm never there for my family. I'm always there at work. See what I mean? It, it, when you see kids try and go to the extreme opposite of their parents, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, there's that same root attitude. Anyways, um, <clears throat> in Song of Solomon, they met in the vineyard. This is explained at the end of the book. Um, and they fell in love as she was working. So there's a few things here. Love involves action, of course, not just feeling. And it also involves effort. So there's a few things. First off, love does oftentimes come with feelings. Okay. Next, love involves action. It's easy to say I love, but it's hard to actually follow through with that, which leads us to the third point. Love has to involve some kind of effort, which means that there's going to be conflict, which means there's going to be times that you want to get a divorce or break it off or whatever. So uh, not every relationship is started with love, but you can always learn to love. So let's go on to the outline of Song of Solomon. Uh, there is a lot of debate, so I'm not telling you this is the standard for the outline, but this is the one that we are going to follow. Um, there's the courtship, dating, engagement, whatever word you want to want to call it. it goes from uh, the beginning all the way to chapter 3, verse 5. Now, verse 1 is kind of more of an introduction, so you don't actually have to include it in the outline if you don't want to. You could say the courtship or the dating or engagement, whatever you want to call it, starts in 1-2. One, 1-1 one, one is, is this, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. That's verse 1. So it's not really relevant to the rest of that line. Uh, then it goes on to the wedding um, in 3.6 through 5.1. Uh, and then after that is has married life, and it talks about some things that, that married people go through. Um, there's a lot of really good gems in Song of Songs that I feel like are not really paid attention to because people don't really like this book. Um, I know it sounds weird to say I don't like that book of the Bible, but you'd be surprised how many people don't like this book. And then there's the conclusion in uh, verse 5 of chapter 8 that goes through verse 14. Um, any questions on the outline? No. Nope. Nope. And as soon as you're done writing. Good. Okay, so then uh, a few last points before we end. Uh, the Song of Songs... Uh, it has a very good, very, very good contrast with the fertility cults. So um, in ancient days, they had what was called the fertility cult. Now this, they had a few different things for this. Um, first off, the name of the god was invoked. Um, well, you don't see that in Song of Songs. Next off, uh, sex was always kind of involved in some way or another. One big way was maybe, um, for instance, I've already told you guys about it before, but there was uh, at one time in a certain city uh, – the, the girls, when they came of age, had to lose their virginity before they could go on with life or before they could get married. So um, they would go out to this temple and just kind of wait until they had to take her. So there's that. Uh, another way that the fertility cult, cult was used is um, the king would have sex with the high priestess. Um, another way it was done was in uh, – they're called orgies. It's mass sex. So besides just sex with one person and another person. Another way is it was actually called the fertility cult. It was um, where you would go and have sex with a, with a priest or priestess, and it would somehow guarantee that you would become more fertile uh, in your own personal relationship. What happened to the priestess? No, the priest being righteous. 
Uh, that was really a, a, a Jewish thought. Um, the, the pagan cults didn't have that idea. Um, in fact, the prophets for the pagan cults, uh, they, they wouldn't really talk about coming back to holiness. They would more call their people back to more tradition. So, for instance, the gods are angry with you because you didn't offer the right sacrifices, so if you want, them, if you want your luck to get better, you need to go offer some sacrifices. Whereas the prophets, the biblical prophets, they said, your heart is not right. You are acting in sin, therefore God is upset with you. That, that's one of the big things that separates the Bible from, from all the ancient literature is the Bible has a focus on the holy, and that was very unheard of. Very unheard of. Um, for instance, uh, life was seen as the gods ejaculating onto the earth. And it seems natural to them. I mean, you, you, water, you water a plant, and a, or you water a seed, and it grows. You have sex with a woman, and she gets pregnant. You know, it, it, there's always that, that cause and effect of, of intimacy there. So it made sense for them to equate that the earth followed the same, you know, the same process. That's why when the Bible was written, guys, I cannot express enough how just found – just amazing the Bible was for its time. Like those ideas were completely countercultural. In so many different ways. And for Moses to have invented those ideas, it just not, it just doesn't make sense. There, there's, there's no explanation that, that, that accounts for Moses just inventing these things. It just it, – it, and not only that, but besides the whole, oh, well, he could have invented them, what other religions in the entire history of the world were monotheistic? There was only Ju Judaism, and from Judaism came Christianity and Islamic. To this day… Those are still the only three monotheistic religions out there, and they all came from the same sources of Moses. So before you say, oh, well, you know, that can be discredited to his just imagination, that – it doesn't fit the facts. And in, Mo, in, the, in the law of Moses, it talked about you couldn't even go up steps to an altar because you might accidentally show your nakedness while you were going up to the altar. That was completely unheard of. Why would that have mattered at all to the pagans? But to Moses, this was a very big thing, and that's just amazing. Anyways, so the Song of Songs contrasts with that. It doesn't talk about calling – invoking any deity. It doesn't talk about having sex with you know any third party. It's just love, which is just completely crazy. So then um, we see another big thing in the Song of Songs, which once again has been blurred fantastically throughout the years. Song of Songs talks about sex, but it talks about it within limits. See, people always go to this goes to the extreme with sex. Either everything has to do with sex, and there's no rules to sex. You just have sex with whoever you want, whenever you want. Or they go to the other extreme and say sex is evil. But Song of Songs gives us a nice balance between those two, those, uh, those two of acknowledging sex while still giving it limits. Um, it talks about love, not just duty, manipulation, attraction, or forced. Okay, obviously being forced into sex would, would not be love. <laughs> I don't think I have to elaborate on that one. Uh, but uh, in those days, it wasn't uncommon for an arranged marriage or you know, for a political marriage or stuff like that. But rather than talking about doing your duty as a son or as a, as a daughter, it talks about love, which to me blows my mind because people didn't mass marry back then for love. That's more of a modern day. Uh, throughout the years, people have always gotten married for love, right. but it wasn't the common factor. Nowadays, it's the common factor for people to get married out of love. Right. Um, also, it, it, the relationship wasn't about manipulation. It was about two people genuinely loving and caring for people, which is another crazy thing. And then another thing is it talks about love, not just attraction. These, these are things that don't really go with our how we see the world. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish the two. Of what? Love and attraction. Yes. Yes. And that's because there's these little things in our brains that go off and say, you need to reproduce. People right. are people are in essence sophisticated roosters. We yeah. see a hen and we think we have to mate with it. <laughs> I don't know why, guys. That's just the way men think. <laughs> um, anyways, um, the song, Book of Song, song uh, Solomon, it talks about commitment not just until you're done. It talks about the love, but it also talks about the conflict. And talks about staying committed past that, which is just amazing because if it was all about love, then as soon as that love is gone, you can just go ahead and move on because I'm no longer in love with them, right? I fell out of love. But Song of Solomon gives a healthy balance between 
commitment, but not always wanting to be committed. <laughs> um, so uh, throughout this, though, I think it becomes obvious that romance and commitment build on each other. I'll show you guys a chart next week that gets my point across, but um, that's not for this week. Uh, it talks about problems, not just rainbows and honeymoon. You know, it doesn't just talk about the good part of love. It also talks about the hard part of love. Um, marriage is too often forsaken. Love is too often abused. And sex is too often misused. But in the Song of Solomon, it really gives a nice little balance of sticking with marriage, not abusing love, and sex being used correctly. I mean, it's really just a, a, a nice book that if the... As much as people don't read it, if we were without Song of Solomon, we would be drastically reduced in a lot of our conversation on intimate relationships. Think really quick, but aside, aside from Song of Songs, where in the Bible talks about such intimacy between married people? It doesn't exist. If we were without that part, we would be at a loss. Now, less so of single people, but... Um, okay. So just uh, that brings us to a very important point that I want to look at, message for singles. Um, and we'll kind of build on this. I'll try to mention things as we go along. But not everybody here is in a relationship, so I wanted to kind of just highlight a few things. First off, sex is not casual. It is only for marriage. Um, don't feel like you have to get involved sexually in a person to find your worth. Um, if you would like to be involved sexually, you need to get married. Um it's, it's definitely not for just a casual thing, and it will do you harm, and it will do the person harm. Think of it like this. When you have sex with someone you're not married to, you're taking something that's not yours to take. I think that's a really good uh, idea of it. Think of – yeah, well, yeah. Uh, don't settle in a relationship because you want to feel loved. It's a trap. You'll wake up one day feeling trapped, and they'll always feel less than loved because you, you did it for selfish reasons. Now, let me just kind of meet that with this. Everybody who gets married gets married for selfish reasons, and it takes you a couple years to figure out that you did that. Everybody does it. Is it necessarily wrong then? It's no, necessary. not necessarily wrong, no. But just be aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> because you can try to have the best intentions in the world, but then after you marry, you're like, let me give you an example. Okay, me and Gracie get married, and get married, and I have the idea that she's going to always make me breakfast every morning. Okay, this is just an example. So then um, she doesn't make me breakfast in the morning, and I realize that I married her for wrong reasons. I married her for breakfast in the morning. I didn't marry her to benefit her. See what I mean? Marriage is basically giving of yourself completely for another person's better better interest. It's a mutual. It's a mutual. It's yes, but as a husband, your job is not. To make sure that you're getting yours. It's not like a – what's it called? A, you know, when you put the quarter in and you get the – Vending machine. Yeah. Yeah. Marriages for men are not vending machines. And the problem is is men naturally see women as a vending machine. We kind of put something in and we expect something back. But the biblical image of what a man is supposed to do looks more like constantly repairing a vending machine regardless of whether it works. Well, what I mean by that is this. Not that women are broken. That's not what I'm trying to say. But – Men constantly surrendering themselves and giving themselves for the betterment of the woman. Right. Even if exactly. it doesn't profit him, still doing something because it profits her. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Like, for instance, my wife is sore. I'm going to rub her regardless of whether I get sex afterwards. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, I know I know the That's repairing way to put it, yeah. repairing the vending machine, I think, was a bad analogy to draw because that kind of gave off the assumption that women are broken and men need to fix them. I wasn't trying. I wasn't trying to say that, and... So sorry about that. Um, just know that that's not what I was trying to say. Yeah, but anyways, don't settle in a relationship because you want to feel loved. You don't know how many people rush into enter a relationship because they want to feel loved. This guys, this happens all the time. This isn't like, oh no, I would never do that. You'd be surprised what desperation causes you to do. You would be surprised. Okay, don't look for something from people who can't provide it. A lot of times people have problems in marriages not just because they think that they can fix them and then find out that they can't, but also because um, they're looking for something that, that that person can't really provide. Like, for instance, I want to be happy, so I'll get married. Well, if you weren't happy before you got married, you're not going to be happy after you got married because now you have another person to have to sacrifice yourself for. And if you're a selfish person already just looking out for yourself, this is not going to work as you think so. Yeah. Um, so don't look for something that the people can't provide. Your spouse cannot provide you with happiness. They can They will. There will be times when they don't make you laugh. There will be times when it's an uphill battle. There will be times when you're not getting anything out of it. There's just that's just going to happen. It's 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 any time that you have a relationship with a real person that's going to happen. The only way around it is to have a relationship with a robot. But uh, I don't think robotics are there yet. 
Actually, so. yeah, people are. They have designed. Uh, no, no, yeah, they have, but they it's have definitely not the same that, caliber as a woman. No, Let's just leave no. it at that. Uh, don't rush a relationship. In fact, this is repeated three times in Song of Songs. Don't rush it. You don't rush it. Love until, until yes. Deserved. And this is a very, very important verse because nowadays you see kids, for instance, rushing into – we see we have 12-year-olds dating, guys. Yeah. And we I have people rushing into a sexual relationship, and we have people – and a lot of other things like that. But my moral of the story being – and Song of Solomon tells us three times, don't rush into it. So um, don't kiss and touch if you aren't serious. Um, in fact, one of the times in Song of Songs that she says, don't awaken love until it's, you know, don't do that. Um, one of the times she says that they're actually in the process of kissing before they're married, and so then she brings that up. So it's 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 kind of a big point in Song of Songs. Uh, don't kiss and touch if you aren't serious. And here's another thing. Women are very, very sensitive. And I think without women, I think men would be a lot worse off because men really aren't sensitive. Like so, for instance, is it, would you consider it abnormal that some are? No. Everybody has that. So I mean, I yeah, no, I get that. I, I consider myself emotional too, but I'm talking about by and large. My mom tried to guilt trip me about something the other day, and I was like, Mom, I, I'm, I'm not a woman. If you're wanting me to sit here and, like, f share my feelings and cry about it on the floor with you, I'm not going to do that. Like, right. no. <laughs> if you want to actually have a conversation, we can have a conversation. But if you're trying to guilt trip me, I'm just not into that. Whatever. Like, I just, <laughs> it's just not going to work on me. You know, and Gracie's tried to, tried to guilt trip me too, and my mom already burnt out my guilt trip sensors. Yeah, like, that's the first year of marriage. <laughs> yeah, she tried to do it, and she was like, man, darn your mom for already using that up. <laughs> By the time that I was 18, I had been guilt tripped yeah, so often. So it's just like, that. whatever. Anyways, um, so when you when you kiss and touch a woman and stuff, when you aren't serious about her, this does a lot of emotional damage. Um, and it, it does damage to you, but the thing is, men are very used to kind of muting their emotions because they want to be the tough guy, you know, and they don't want to actually share themselves. So they'll, like, pretend like they're okay, and sometimes they'll even make themselves completely deadened. And, you know, actually, when you have sex with a lot of women, that kind of happens anyways. You just kind of get deadened emotionally. So, anyways, uh, don't allow the harm of intercourse without a foundation for marriage. And I do mean harm. Inter sex can, can really be a destructive force if it's outside of the bonds of marriage. It really can be. Um, in fact, I would say the majority of the time it is. Um... It's, it's like a fire, you know. You gotta keep it within, within boundaries, otherwise. Yeah, that's that's kind yeah. of a good example. Um, so okay, here's another last little thing here for for single people. Feelings fade, but for the married people, you can keep it alive. You can keep the emotions alive, and you can keep the 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 passion alive. You can keep the love alive. It takes work, daily work, but you can do it. Um, but with that being said, naturally feelings do fade. So if you're single and you feel like, oh man, I just got these feelings that are out of out of control, just hold on, hold your pants. And here's the thing. Here's here's the thing. It, when you get married, check this out, okay? You will get feelings for other people besides your spouse after you get married. That's hard to imagine. Everybody, everybody thinks that once they get married, like I will never have eyes for another person. You will be tempted like crazy, and they'll be. I guarantee you this: after you get married, you will fall in love with at least one other person. You have to control your emotions. You have to keep pursuing your spouse, and you have to move past it. It is going to happen. It, it's just, na it's just nature. Because your body, something in it says, you know, hey, let's let's produce children. So in order to do that, it pumps you full of hormones and says, hey, let's have sex. It is more common in, in, in men than, than women because women don't have testo as high of testosterone. But anyways, you get what I'm saying. Any any questions on any of this? Because we're going to start in on Song of Solomon next week. So, good? Uh -huh. Me, uh, Isaiah, you're itching, bud. Let me take another. I'm going to take a picture of that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, for me, I've been single for five years now. Mm-hmm. You know, I found that a lot of guys, when they first break up, it's like really hard, but then after a while, you kind of get used to being single. Is that what happened? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, think about it. You don't have to clean up your messes. Nobody right. nags you about not washing your dishes. Right. And, I uh, actually go in and out of my house yeah. on my own. I don't have to call. Yeah. Now, see, these are all things you can't do when you're married. 
when you when you when you're married, it's we have to do the dishes. We have to do, have have to do the laundry yeah. because it's both of your laundry. It's yeah. both of your dishes. It's both of your house. Everything you have to share and work together for. And it's like, ugh. Uh, yeah. Men naturally are very uh, superior mindset. Men don't need any help in feeling like they're better than women. They naturally have this in them. Uh, it's just something that they don't have to work towards. <laughs> we we uh, we always think that we're superior to women. We think that because we're more logic than emotion, that that means that women are Ill, are in, in, impossible to understand and that they're just Ill, a, a completely illogical messes. And that's not true, but it's just a bias that men carry around with them um, and kind of this idea that I'm better than you. So, you know, y yeah. you have all that, and yeah. uh, it, that's fine when you're single, but then when you're married, you you, you got to yeah. change that. Yeah, you yeah. you can't let that attitude carry on. Like, it's not oh my wife's nagging me. It's oh my wife told me to do something, so I need to do it. You know, it, it's completely changes. But uh -huh. when you're single, you can joke about that stuff because oh, yeah. you're single. Like it doesn't matter. But once you're married, you gotta change everything. You know, it's yeah. funny. There's so many men, uh, especially in Christian circles, who say like, oh, you know, the, since the man is supposed to have like total and complete authority over everything. You know, which I which I disagree woman, with. Well, yeah, but. In a sense where the woman can't tell me what to do at all. Or, yeah. You know, ah. No, I, yeah. I, I totally disagree with that. I've heard, I heard it a lot, but I, I always not, disagree with it. Uh, yeah. It's not It's not true. So well, unbiblical. And it's, the, it's, the women are mm. boss of the house. Yeah. And being well, no, no, I don't go well, to that extreme either. No, but... but, but in I a sense, mean, they are. In a, in no, 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 no. It's no. not that the women are the... It, it's this, you know, women are essentially fairly easy to understand. They all want pretty much the same thing. They want to be heard. They want to be loved. 99% of the women who ask for divorces, and this is you can take this to the bank, they don't really want a divorce. They just want their husband to listen to them and love them. Which, is that so much to ask for, really? It shouldn't be. I mean, honestly here, guys, women really aren't that hard to understand. They just think differently than guys. There's a difference. So, you know, let's kind of keep things in perspective there. But anyways... Uh, so, no, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that women should be the, the ruler of the castle. Well, no. Jesus should be the ruler of the well, castle. Yes, yes. But a husband should put his wife first, and the wife should obviously lo love her husband and everything, yeah. but the husband should definitely put his wife but, first. Well, well, the thing is, was that when I was growing up, my mom was the discipline of the house. Mm -hmm. Because my, well, my dad didn't really discipline us. It was my mom. Uh -huh. And then she usually... Mm -hmm. You know, that was actually more common than you would think uh, in ancient days, oh, yeah. too. And then, so I always believe that the women are, you know, are always kind of like the, the boss of the... Well, see, the problem, with why, why I'm addressing that is because there really needs to be a healthy discussion before you get married to somebody where you kind of talk about your views on how children should be disciplined and your views about finances and stuff because the husband shouldn't be spending money behind the wife's back and the wife shouldn't be spending money behind and, and they should be parenting in a way that they're both agreeing on so i mean and, and so they really that if there's an idea in the house that one is the king of the house or the ruler of the house that's an unhealthy marriage because it really needs to be more of meeting together on that um, and you're going to find that when one takes over for the other one, there's going to be a lot of discontent. A lot of discontent. I, I, I guess it's meant to be more like a team. It, exactly, more like a team. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, if you, especially if you look in Genesis, you know, where it talks about the woman um, being put there to help, you know, the same word is used for how God helps us. So to say that women helping us means that they're inferior to our goals is not what the Bible's saying because then. God would be inferior to our goals. See what I mean? Yeah. But at the same time, there were no houses back then. There was no laundry back then. So we know that Eve's job wasn't to sit at home and make food. And <laughs> So what what was her job to do? Well, what his job was to do. See? Women was, a woman was given a job just like man was. Working isn't a part of the curse. God gave his work before the fall ever happened. Mm -hmm. The part of the curse was that thorns were going to grow and it was going to make work a little bit harder. And that they'd have to actually work for the food more. So, work wasn't a part of the curse. And Proverbs even clarifies that, that women can work too, isn't it? So, 
She makes her hands, what's the same? Makes her hands strong. There's a lot of things in there that talks about it. But anyways, uh, so there's just a lot of, of misunderstandings about, about men and women, I think. But anyways, I think Song of Solomon really does a lot to, to kind of... I haven't read that book in a long time. ...move towards healing. So any other questions or anything? We're good?